Aloha and welcome to Condo Insider, our weekly show about association living. And I'm calling this show, it's a wrap. The 2019 legislature is over. I think there were over 4,000 bills introduced in general in the association industry. There were about 40 bills introduced. And now we're down to the legislature having adjourned. And there were seven bills that will be either law already or are enrolled before the governor and we hope they become law. So I've invited Jane Sugimura, my co-host and good Hello. friend, Hello. who has worked with me and others in the industry to lobby for better legislation for associations. And so which, what, what grade do you give the legislature for our stuff? Well, uh, I'm happy that they passed Senate Bill 551, so I, I, I think maybe I'd give them a B minus. A B minus. A B minus. Otherwise, it would be a very dismal score. And why I would you? Because I, 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 I'm just very unhappy with the way the legislature is, uh, has been operating. And, you know, at the very end, at the very end, you know, there's this tradition when you get the House and the Senate, they get together and they sing uh, Aloha Oi, and they didn't do it. They locked the door. And, and then if you look at the photograph of the House, there's not 50 people in that circle. So that tells you that there's discord at the legislature. That's so, not a good sign. So what you're saying to me, the tradition where the House and the Senate get together in the House chambers and they hold hands in kumbaya in yes. a sign of unity and love. Right, that didn't they, happen. The House locked the doors. The senators were pounding on the door to get in. Right. And only some of the representatives in the House were singing Aloha Hot Hawaii, Hawaii. Yeah. which is just traditional aloha. So, so I don't know where the aloha spirit was at the legislature, but sure wasn't there the last day. So you're telling me the word unity didn't exist. You're right. Uh, there, there, uh, there's, some, yeah. there's some discord happening over there, and I just hope it, 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 it stays in the legislature and doesn't make its way to the governor's office because all of the bills that we're going to be talking about today, we really want them to pass. They okay. really need to pass. Well, let's just start out with House Bill 61, the only House bill that has been enrolled to the governor. Has, uh, it's not law yet. And it had to do with issues surrounding uh, the priority of payments. Give, me, right. give us and your there, take. Yeah, I think this is a good bill. For, first of all, it's a, it's, a, it's a fix. It's a repair. I mean, there was a lot of contention last year, and the priority of payments bill uh, basically took uh, a provision that was in the statute that basically allowed uh, uh, associations to set a priority as to how the monthly maintenance fees would be applied. The problem with that is, is if you made the resolution 20 years ago and then a new person moves into the unit two years ago, right, they don't know what that policy is unless you give it to every new person. And, 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 and what happens is that sometimes there are late payments or sometimes there's a fine. And what they don't understand is that their condominium, you know, monthly dues, is applied to these late charges and fines and attorney's fees, and they end up being delinquent. And, and this resulted in some issues that, and, and, and in a worst case scenario, it ended up in foreclosure, right? Because, all of, because of the priority of payments policy. And so the year before, Bill Act 95, uh, and this was basically Senator Roz Baker's campaign, because she said nobody should lose their home because of the, you know, uh, through foreclosure, because of this po prior to payments policy. Her bill basically deleted that and said, you can't do that anymore. If, in other words, when, when, when a person pays their maintenance fee bill, it applies to maintenance fees. It, even if they're delinquent, even if they're late charges, even if they're fines and penalties, the, the maintenance fee payment only applies to that monthly payment. And if there are late fees or attorney's fees or fines, that goes, it, 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 it just kind of goes to the end. But then there were some other payments that really needed to be uh, addressed. And these included things like uh, utilities, you know, like submetered electrical charges. And so because that wasn't in the, the first go around, there were other items. And, 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 and so that's what this bill is, it build fixes what should have been done last night. Let me time. just summarize it in a, in a different perspective. Okay. Previously, before last year's Act 95, boards would set up prior, a policy where they'd apply payments. 
And first would be the legal fees, then the late fees, and it would go down the ladder, and usually leaving maintenance fees last, right. resulting in unpaid maintenance fees if the person didn't pay the fine, for example, mm -hmm. relating to a foreclosure. So Senator Baker, rightfully so, changed the bill that any payments made has to be to common expenses first. Right. So you couldn't get into this uh, unintended consequence of foreclosure. Now I want you to think for a second about your visa bill. When you get your visa bill, you may have charged at Macy's and Nordstrom's and Best Buy, whatever it may be. When you make your payment, you're not saying pay Best Buy but not playing Macy's or whatever. Right. It's just going into this big computer, just like management companies, and they're applying this lump sum, and they've got to apply it to something so there's a priority of payment. They have right. to apply it. Right. And what the original bill did, it didn't give the board any latitude and after paying the common expenses, how to apply the rest of the payments. Right. And what this bill does is give them latitude to establish priority of payments for expenses after the common expenses have been right. paid. Therefore, you protect the unintended consequence of the foreclosure, but at the same time, the board can say first the storage locker, next the parking fees, next maybe the first priority will be the uh, having to buy the HO6 policy because right. the owner didn't do it. Okay. So it gives them a little more latitude because the way computerized world we live in, uh, we demand some way for a management company to efficiently apply a gross amount of money to all these individual charges. Right. But the, that, the, the, the end result is, is that they would not be applied to late charges, legal fees, or that, fines. Yeah, they have to be last. Yes. Late charges, interest, and legal fees. So it's really a fix to uh, take into consideration the need to first apply payments to common expenses, then give some latitude on the non-common expenses, because every association is a little different. And then, in all cases, legal aid fees and fines have to be last. Right. So that's what that does. And that is enrolled to the governor. It passed unanimously out of uh, uh, both, um, house, uh, both chambers, House and the Senate. It doesn't seem to be a conflict. Uh, my prediction is it becomes law. Yeah. I, 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 think, I don't think that there is any issue there. Well, since you brought up Senate Bill 551, which is the foreclosure bill, yes. let's, 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 let's dive into that one. Okay. And, 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 and in a way, they're kind of related because the same pe uh, some of the people who were opposing 551 were the same people who opposed the priority of payments. They said, you know, because those condominiums had priority of payments, they were applying it to late fees and attorney's fees and, and fines. And, and so people were being put, placed into foreclosure because of the priority of payments. And so they were saying that this is a, a form of abuse. And, and, and uh, 550, um, uh, Senate Bill 551 basically confirmed that uh, associations could do non-judicial foreclosures. But I think it clarified that, you know, um, that, you know, certain conditions had to uh, uh, be present before they could do it. But the important thing about 551 is there was this uh, appellate court decision. And the appellate court decision basically said that, uh, that uh, the associations uh, that, 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 that did non-judicial foreclosure didn't have a legal basis for doing it because the language in the, in, you know, that there was nothing uh, in the, the um, uh, legislature. I mean, there, there was no language between the homeowners and the association that allowed them to do it, despite the fact that there was language in 514A at the time, which, because that was 1999. Right. That, so, uh, so the general issue was, is that, uh, for years, 1999, uh, while Part 1 existed, they were uh, using non-judicial foreclosures. Uh, that got repealed in 2012, I think it was, right. and Part 6 took its place. But during that period between 1999 and 2012, ignoring maybe the statute of limitation issues, people were foreclosed on new judicial. And what happened was when the appellate courts ruled you had to have it in your governing documents, it opened the floodgate of plaintiff attorneys and people who lost their homes to sue their associations, saying you didn't have, even though I'm delinquent, didn't pay my bills. Right. You have the right to, uh, you didn't have the right to foreclose on me. And now you're asking all the paying owners to reimburse and to pay a penalty to the person who never paid and was foreclosed on. And this basically fixes that and reaffirms the right uh, 
that this was always the legislature's intent right. to allow non judicial And in, in, in fact, the, the, the preamble of the bill goes into great detail and points out to the fact that the committee report in 1999 specifically addressed the fact that the legislature uh, uh, wanted, uh, intended the, uh, the associations to be able to do non-judicial foreclosures because at that time what they were addressing was uh, uh, of, of the, the fact that the courts were, it was, that we were going through a recession and the courts were just jammed with any kind of foreclosure. And so we, we couldn't get we couldn't get a, a motion for summary judgment for six or eight months. You couldn't get a motion to confirm for another six or eight months. It took you over a year to get a foreclosure, uh, to do a foreclosure. And meanwhile, you're not getting paid. If you're the association, you're not getting paid. And then the other uh, owners who are making their monthly payments are then uh, required to, you know, pay additional funds, which isn't fair. Yeah, I think what it is is that it's a it's a clear explanation to the courts what their intent was. Mm -hmm. And it only really applies to these old foreclosures because, you know, the ones that were foreclosed upon in part six wouldn't be affected by this, I don't think. No, and, and, and there, there are a lot more safeguards now. I mean, where, you know, you have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you have to do the, um, the notice of the uh, default letter. And in this, in this legislation, it makes it really clear that you cannot do a non-judicial foreclosure against active military. If you, do, you have an active military person, you have to go and do uh, a, a judicial foreclosure. But having been to all the hearings, and it was like delayed three or four times in conference committee, it was a pretty bitterly fought bill. Yes. Because the plaintiff's attorneys and a few owners who uh, lost their homes were making emotional testimony. and. Uh, frankly, it wasn't very factual if you look at the actual history of those particular cases. But the reality of it is it's gone, uh, it's enrolled before the governor. Any but, prediction? But, uh, well, it, I think we're going to have to work real hard and still keep up the fight because, you know, I've been told that there's the same people who opposed 551 are also going to be lobbying the governor to veto the bill. And so the, 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 it's not over. It's not over. And we will be asking... Uh, our constituency and you know association members to you know contact the governor and ask him to uh, to uh, sign Senate Bill five fifty one. Okay, well before we take a break, let's take an easy one, which is Senate Bill five five two, which has to do with uh, giving the developers uh, oh, yeah. with five fourteen a. Uh, uh, this has uh, been enrolled to the governor as well, so it's not law yet. Uh, what was the 552, we sent a bill 552, and what was the intent of that? Well, that one too, what happened is uh, earlier, there was a previous bill that, that uh, repealed 5, uh, 514A. So that, and that bill became, that law became effective on January 1 of this year. And what happened is you had condominiums that were created under 514A, and maybe some of them had not been sold. Some of the units had not been sold. And so, therefore, they would not qualify under 514B. And so, and, and you know, I, I remember when the, the bill was first introduced, you know, to repeal 514A. And the same developers came and said, oh, no, you can't do this. We have these units that are unsold. And, and Senator Baker says, well, you got a year. You got a year. Go out and sell them. I mean, it's been all these years you've had, you know, you, you've had it. So, you know, and you got to. Time to fish your cup eight, go out there and sell those units. But what happened is by the end of 2018, they, they remained unsold. So in order to be able to sell them, they came to the legislature and they asked for another year. And I think that's what this yeah, is about. I think the important thing is if the uh, owners or the board members here, 514A has been extended for another year. That's not true. It only applies to developers with unsold units where in the original public report, they were, they were formed under 514A. So it's got a very narrow area for developers of unsold units. So for associations out there that have been formed, 514A has been repealed and 514B is the law. Right. And on that note, we're going to take a short one minute break and we'll be right back. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii, 
We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Apicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so much. We're back and we're talking about the bills that have either been made into law because the governor has signed them, or those that have been what we call enrolled to the governor where he, he's gonna make a decision to either put it on the veto list, and I think he has until June 24th to put it on the veto, potential veto list, and he has until July 7th to uh, veto it, and if he doesn't veto it automatically, it becomes law. So let's talk about just a couple of real miscellaneous bills. Seven, Senate Bill 725 that has to do, under the current law, I shouldn't say under the current law because they signed this, that's Act Number right, 7 now. Right. But the previous law said that associations after their annual meetings only had to keep the ballots and proxies for 30 days. Right. So what does this do? It can, you have, now the associations have to keep it for 90 days. And this is for the people who have questions about, you know, an election. And so it gives them uh, an opportunity to challenge an election. And so it just means that you keep the ballots 60 days more, longer than you usually do. It was interesting about that because uh, from a technical point of view, you have 90 days to give them notice you want to review it. So it doesn't mean on the 90th day they're going to burn it. If you wrote them a letter saying, I want to review it, they've got to make them available to you. They couldn't let the time run out and, right. and do something. So you have 90 days to do it. And I can just speak for most of the major management companies. I don't think we ever destroyed those things for well over a year after the election mm -hmm. because of these types of questions that could come up. There was no real incentive. But the industry took the position, there's no harm in this bill to give them a couple more months uh, should there be a questionable election and someone right. wants to review it. So that is now act number seven. It is law. So you are required to maintain the ballots and the proxies um, uh, for 90 days from the date of the annual meeting. And, uh, and that's what Senate Bill 725 does. And it is law, Act Number 7. And this, is, this next one is also law, which allows the electronic voting. Senate Bill 1288 became Act Number 14, which allows electronic voting by members mm -hmm. under specific circumstances. Yes, and, and, and I guess this is a law for timeshares or huge or large uh, condominium associations, right? Yes. The problem is when you get to these 500, 700 unit condominiums, these timeshare organizations, counting ballots, even for simple yes, no ballots, can be very time consuming because it's manual. Today, in this electronic world we live in, there is software, secure software, with audit trails available. In fact, I just met with a vendor a couple of days ago, you know, looking at his platform. It's incredible the detail that's available and the protection and security that's available in that. But what it does is allow the board voluntarily to choose electronic voting that meets specific criteria, which would be the safety factors and you know and the audit factors is what the and is what that criteria is. Is this expensive? Well, this particular vendor, without much discussion was saying you could do the whole meeting for a dollar a unit. Wow. So if in fact you had a 700 unit association, it would be $700 to use their software before any negotiation on the price, which may be available. Um, but what happens is you would do this voting in a really incredible way on your phone. And there are provisions for manual voting. Mm -hmm. And you would have your election results in two or three minutes. Wow. With an easy audit trail. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so uh, and it doesn't... associations don't have. I mean, they can if somebody uh, brings it up, they can opt out. They don't have to. No, it's, it's strictly voluntary because if you're a 30, 40 unit association where 10 or 15 people typically show up to the meeting because of the proxies. It doesn't make sense because you can count them manually just as fast as you can anywhere else. Right. We have associations with 780 members, 41 percentages of common interest, 41 different types of units, you know, with all these different classes of ownership with, with between the mixed use and the commercial and, and who can vote and can't vote. That can all be entered into the system with all the safeguards so that you can do this right on the dime, right wow. momentarily. That's impressive. And then the association has to voluntarily say, do they want to do it? They don't have to do it still. It's just, it's just we're trying to move the industry into more of an electronic world because who wants to sit there for an hour while they count the ballots? Right. You know? So this is, this is voluntary, and what it does is it just allows a different form of uh, doing an election. And I've met with one vendor, but I have to tell you, there's other vendors out there working on this to provide solutions. So... In any competitive world, new product, the pricing will probably uh, move downward versus upward at this point in time. We shall see. Yeah. So this look at Senate Bill 1325, which is now Act 27. It has to do with investment of And this is something that the funds. banks were pushing. The banks were, you know, really wanted this because I guess they, they have a product that they, they feel uh, is, is something that would benefit them as well as the associations. Well, what it is, is there's something called a government money market fund that has the same principal protection. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that associations who want to get a little higher yield would want to buy into a government money market fund. Most of the local lawyers I know in town who do this as an industry said the current law already provides for that. It may be a little unclear, but they believe, if you look at the language, it already provided for this. Well, you know, the banks and their lawyers, they want to be protected. They're, they're not putting you into something they can't do. So mm -hmm. this was a clarification bill in my book. It didn't change anything because I tell you, many, many associations already invest in government money market funds. It just clarified that that is one of the acceptable exactly. options. So that's, that's and that, not And that's new. already, that, the governor already signed that one. He did. That's Act 27. Okay. So the next one, which has not been signed yet, but we should mention is Senate Bill 767, right. which is the famous handyman bill that, you know, <laughs> under the old law, you could hire a handyman, an unlicensed contractor, for up to $1,000, and that 1000 included the GET, so you can figure 95%, 950 bucks, you could, you could sign a contractor. And under the old law, which remains under the new proposed law, you couldn't take a $5,000 job and sign five $1,000 contract. You'd be looked at, if it's the same part of the same scope of work, that you'd be looked at, at trying to defeat the law. But the new law does, you know. It, it allows uh, $1,500. It goes to $1,500 $1, plus GET. Right. So it's like. Uh, you can do more. It's like a 55% increase in what right. you have today. And, you know, and I don't remember the exact dates, but it was like. When this bill was originally passed, it was the 1980s, the late 80s. Oh, and dear. so uh, the contractors were against it. And the Honolulu Board of Realtors was the big organization pushing this. Uh, we supported it. But uh, it did pass then at Bill 767, which allows now the handyman exemption, unlicensed person, to do up to $1,500 of work plus GET. And that $1,500 includes labor and material. Oh, okay. So that's, that's what that number is. Okay. And that's pretty much the, where the legislature, the wrap on the legislature this year. But since we have a couple of minutes, City Council Bill 13, what's that all about? Okay. That's, not even, that's not even passed yet. But no, got... it, 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 and it's, it went to, uh, it's in the committee, and their committee meeting is on Tuesday. And Bill 13 is a bill for uh, rubbish removal. It's a bulky item pickup. And uh, there is also a pilot project that's in the works. The, the mayor did a press conference last week on it. The, the, the uh, pilot project starts on June 1, and it goes from Foster Village to Waikai. And there's a lot of condominium associations, and co-op buildings in that area. 
That's where the problem is. And the, and the city environmental services, these are the guys who do you know, the rubbish pickup. They've been making the rounds to the neighborhood boards. And so they showed up at our neighborhood board last month and they talked about it. And I asked a whole bunch of questions and they couldn't answer them. I said, number one, uh, and they told me the bill doesn't really specify, but it applies to condos. And it means that the, your site manager or your resident manager is, I mean, the whole bill is that instead of having a specific one date for bulky item pickup in your area, each whole household will now call the city, make an appointment. And for a single family home, I think it's three cubic yards. For a, a, an association, they told me it's 20 items. And then what you do is you call the city, make an appointment for them to pick it up. And then this is a bulky item pickup by appointment and you pay. And then so once you call it in and for an association, I'm not talking about single family homes because for an association, your site manager has to call the city and say, you know, we have 20 items to pick up and you have to tell them what it is. And for anybody who lives in a condominium and has, is, is involved in bulky, you don't know what's going to be on the sidewalk on the bulky item pickup day. You don't know how, what's going to be out there and you don't know how large it's going to be. Well, everybody just goes, they see their neighbor across the street, put it out there, and they go say, oh, I got this too, I'll go put mine out at the same time. Right. And so, and, and I hate to say it, the cost of administration of that, of just collecting this, because I can't imagine it's going to be super expensive, but even at 10 or $20 a pickup, the cost of administ administration is going to be awful. And, you know, and the thing of it is, is that they're making the association do the collection. For maybe, maybe you've got three or four people in your building putting out stuff for that one collection. And you have to be the one to then collect the, the fee from the residents. And, you know, to me, that's really well, not our function. Well, we've survived the legislature. Now we have to go back to the city council with and the bulk refuse. And then we have the vacation rental bill, which we've never gotten involved in because we represent both sides of that. And we want to let the city council work through that. But again, thank you for all your hard work in the legislature. You're very important to us and you do a lot for us in the legislature. And uh, we appreciate your volunteer time on that and that of Hawaii Council Community Association. And we thank all of you for watching Condo Insider. We've given you, a, in 28 minutes, a quick wrap on the 2019 legislature. And you're welcome to go online to uh, Hawaii legislature and, uh, and see the bills in full. Thank you for watching.